Let's start with a question. What is an inch? I'm sure each and every one of you can give a rough explanation. It's something you've used tens, if not hundreds of thousands of times in your life. But when's the last time you had to actually sit down and think about what an inch might really be? I'm sure some of you are holding your fingers ever so much apart. I'm sure others are more astutely pointing out that it's one twelfth of a foot. But who here actually knows? See, measurement is all around us in almost every aspect of our daily lives. And it's because of this constant immersion to a measurement that we really don't have to sit back and think about what it really means. For those of you here in the room, think about what it took for you to get here today. The clock on your phone telling you what time it was and when to leave. The GPS in your car telling you where to turn and when. The gas gauge reminding you that you forgot to fill up yesterday. And it's because of that constant immersion to measurement that, again, we just really don't have to think about the underlying science and theory behind it. And it's because of that that each and every one of you probably gave an answer ever so much different than everyone else. Now, for the most part, these varying definitions really don't matter. They're going to be close enough for just about any project you're working on. But what happens when it's not? See, as a society, we like to latch onto certain concepts as a given. It's just easier to process that way. We can take things as an automatic fact and just move on with our lives. But what happens when a concept turns out to be just that, a concept? Or more importantly, what happens when we ignore the fact that this is even a possibility altogether? So back to my original question, what is an inch? Well, what if I told you there was no such thing as an inch? See, metrology, or the science of measurement, is arguably the oldest science in existence. The earliest recorded systems of weights and measures date all the way back to the fourth millennium BC. Now, over time, different civilizations created their own unique measurement systems for their own unique circumstances. Most of these were based off of physical items. For example, the foot. Now, the most recognizable ancient unit of measure based on these physical items would be the cubit. This is the unit that helped build the pyramids. It's roughly the distance from the tip of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, plus the width of the palm of whoever the ruling pharaoh was at any given time. <laughs> Now, the problem with this, of course, is that pharaohs don't rule forever, and the pyramids took many years to build. So what happens when you transition from a pharaoh, say, the physical size of Shaquille O'Neal, to one, say, the size of Danny DeVito? In fact, it's been found that there were several definitions of cubits that were as much as four inches apart from each other. And it's because of this that a consistent consolidation of a definition of a measurement is absolutely critical. Now, one person who could have benefited from this consolidation of units, had he realized the need for such a thing, would have been Christopher Columbus. For those of you who remember back to history class, in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Of course, he set sail looking for the East Indies. And of course, he missed by a lot. <laughs> Now, one of the primary reasons he missed by so much is because he made an assumption that the estimation of the Earth's circumference he was using was based on the Roman mile, when it was, in fact, based on the Arabic mile. Unfortunately for Columbus, the Roman mile was about 30% shorter than the Arabic mile. <laughs> Whoops. Now, you might think that such a large-scale and embarrassing mistake would have led to a rapid consolidation of measurement systems across the globe. But stubborn pride is a thing to behold. In fact, it took about 300 more years for an attempt to do so to actually take root. It wasn't until the French Revolution in the late 18th century when the new French government set forth to create a unifying measurement system across the globe. This was the metric system. It was, of course, based off of the meter, which was the Greek word for measure. Now, pretty soon, this unit or this system spread throughout pretty much the rest of the globe. The Industrial Revolution happened. Britain figured it better, better get on board with the times. And suddenly, we had a global measurement system. That is, of course, except for us pesky Americans and a few other countries almost as stubborn as we are. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, enough with the history lesson. This is clearly a problem that we solved years ago. But, as I mentioned, stubborn pride is a thing to behold. In fact, right now today, here in the U.S., there are not one, but two definitions of the foot. First, we have the international foot. This is the foot that we all know and love. And then we have the survey foot. Oh, the survey foot. 
See, the international foot and the survey foot are almost exactly the same. In fact, the difference between the two is only an eighth of an inch over a mile. And for most, almost every person in normal, operating in the practical world, they're basically exactly the same. That is, of course, until you are, say, laying out international borders or, of course, trying to discover the new world. Now, simply defining a system of measurement is only the first step. The next major hurdle to overcome is actually making sure that everybody adopts this system of measurement. And nowhere was this more obvious than on a day in 1628 in Sweden. On this day, the king of Sweden had ordered the launch of the Vasa warship. Now, much like the Titanic, the Vasa warship was considered to be one of the most advanced naval vessels of its time. And also, much like the Titanic, the Vasa warship sank on its maiden voyage. However, very much unlike the Titanic, the Vasa warship didn't wait to sink out by itself in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh no, the Vasa warship sank almost immediately, just a little over half a mile into its maiden voyage, right in front of all the crowds that had gathered to watch and celebrate its launch. <laughs> now, years later, it was discovered that the, part of the reason for this is because parts of the ship had been built much, much heavier than other aspects of it. The reason for this? There were multiple crews working on the ship. Some of them were utilizing a definition of a foot that contained 12 inches. Others, utilizing a definition that contained 11. Whoops. Now, the good news is, our Egyptian friends from earlier had actually already solved this problem thousands of years before the Vasa warship ever took sail. But, as I mentioned, stubborn pride is truly a thing to behold. See, what the Egyptians had done was create what was known as the royal cubit master. And this was essentially a block of granite with some marks inscribed on it, defining exactly what a cubit was at any point in time. This was maintained by the royal architect, and all of the workers building the pyramids were given their own version of this, known as a cubit stick. This was essentially their ruler. Now, in order to make sure that that ruler was consistently reading accurately, each of the workers were required to bring that stick back to the royal architect for comparison against the royal cubit master on every full moon. The failure to do so? Death. And as a result, the calibration industry, the industry that I'm in, was born, albeit a little less dramatic today. <laughs> See, calibration is simply defined by myself as measuring things that measure things. Now, there are far more advanced and intricate definitions available than that, but scientists really like to overcomplicate things. See, calibration is really nothing more than taking an item of a known quantity, also known as a standard, and comparing it against the tool in question that you would like to have calibrated. A very simple example of this would be taking a ruler that you know is calibrated and reading accurately, and taking a tape measure you would like to have calibrated and holding it against that. If the marks on the tape measure line up with the ruler, we know that the tape measure is properly calibrated and reading perfectly accurately. Or a more real-world example of this would be taking an item known as a gauge block, which is basically just a very precisely cut piece of steel, and comparing that against the readings on, for example, a micrometer, as shown here. Now, in order to ensure that we are all operating off of the same definition of a unit of measure, in this case, the inch, it's very important that every measuring device in our world be calibrated to a known standard on regular intervals. Every ruler, every tape measure, every micrometer, everything. See, without this, there would be no way to guarantee that the bolt manufactured on the East Coast would fit into the nut manufactured on the West Coast. And this is simply because of the fact that the two manufacturers could be unknowingly operating with subtly different versions of an inch. But if those manufacturers were to have their measuring devices calibrated on a regular interval back to a known standard, we can guarantee that essentially nowhere on the earth that these items are being manufactured will they be utilizing different definitions. They'll all be operating off the same definition and everything will fit together perfectly. Now, because of a series of random and systemic errors, there has never been, nor will there ever be, such a thing as a perfectly precise measurement. And it's because of this that the, standard I, the calibration standard I mentioned earlier needs to be itself calibrated, in turn, by a series of progressively more accurate standards themselves, all the way back until you get the ultimate definition of what a unit of measure might be. This is a concept known as traceability. 
But who actually gets to define exactly what that ultimate definition is? Instead of a royal architect, here in the US, we have NIST, or the National Institute of Standardization and Technology. Founded in 1901, NIST is the ultimate bearer of weights and measures here in the United States. They're the people who get to decide exactly what an inch is. Now, just like the royal cubit master, NIST maintained a physical standard defining length measurement in the United States for many years. This was essentially just a bar manufactured out of platinum and iridium that contained some marks inscribed on it, helping us know what that answer would be. But there's one major problem when it comes to maintaining physical standards, and that's the fact that all physical items wear down over time. This is a massive problem for the one physical item in our world that's responsible for maintaining order in essentially everything. And it's because of this that conceptual definitions to define a unit of measure are far preferred to physical ones. See, conceptual definitions are based off of mathematical calculations and scientific constants. In other words, they can't change, no matter how long we're talking about. And switching to a conceptual definition is exactly what we did. And we did it far earlier than you may be imagining. Okay, so if there's no such thing that is a physical item defining exactly what an inch, then what is an inch? Well, I hate to break it to you, but there is no such thing as an inch. In fact, there isn't even a conceptual one. See, back in 1958, a conference of English-speaking nations gathered to consolidate their definitions of length measurement across the globe. This, of course, contained the United States. And we, of course, got massively outvoted in favor of the meter. So when we're referring to an inch, what we're actually referring to is just a tiny fraction of a meter. An inch doesn't technically exist. Okay, so if an inch is really just a tiny fraction of a meter, then how is a meter defined? Well, this is where the conceptual definition that I mentioned earlier comes into play. In 1983, based on international agreement, it was agreed that a meter would be defined based on how far light can travel in a vacuum in a very tiny fraction of a second. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny. We're talking about three times 10 to the negative eighth seconds. So there you have it. Everything you knew about an inch is likely a lie. In fact, <laughs> an inch doesn't even really exist. It's really just a tiny fraction of a completely different unit maintained in a completely different standard that doesn't actually physically exist and can only be defined by using headache-inducing math and high-end lab equipment. Sometimes scientists really do get the best of themselves. <laughs> so now that we've gone way further into the rabbit hole in the world of measurement than you may have ever even realized was possible, how do we bring this back to the real world? How do we apply this to normal, everyday life? Imagine for just a moment that it's a hot, muggy summer day. You and your partner finally got around to building that deck that, let's face it, you've been putting off for years now. Um, you've been out in the sun for 10 hours now. You're exhausted. But the good news is, you're almost done. There's only four boards left to place, and it looks like you have exactly enough lumber left to get the job done. Nice planning. Your partner calls over saying that the boards need to be cut to exactly 48 inches. So just like you've done hundreds of times today, you pull out your tape measure, you measure the boards, you get them cut, you walk them over, set them down, and disaster strikes. You realize that every one of those boards are a half inch short. And remember, those were the last pieces of lumber you had left. It looks like your day just got a lot longer. In the back of your head, you can hear your grandpa laughing at you saying, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> but you did that. So for sanity's sake, you pull out your tape measure, check again, and sure enough, the boards are exactly 48 inches. So what went wrong here? Well, the science of metrology tells us any number of things could have gone wrong. Perhaps you and your partner were utilizing different measurement systems. Unlikely. Or perhaps those tape measures weren't properly calibrated. After all, they are just tape measures, and mass production does not mean mass accuracy. The good news is, it really doesn't matter if we ever find out exactly what went wrong. After all, you are just building a deck. It's not a life and death situation. You can always go get more lumber. In other scenarios, you can use sandpaper. You simply don't need a $100,000 measurement device calibrated directly by NIST in order to build a deck in your backyard. In fact, you really don't even need a fully calibrated tape measure. See, overkill in measurement can be just as detrimental to the outcome of the project as ignoring the science altogether. But what happens when it's not? 
What happens when good enough is no longer good enough? You can't simply use sandpaper on a replacement heart valve. Or imagine being given a urinary catheter manufactured by a company that ignored this science. I'm <laughs> going to let you guys fill in the blanks on that one. <laughs> Measurement is all around us, and it's exactly because of this that we have to pay due diligence to the extreme nuances in, in uh, extreme nuances and uh, deep science involved in this. And it's because of this that you need to understand how it applies to your everyday life. See, there's not going to be a coach standing over your shoulder reminding you when and where to apply the lessons learned here today. That's on you. And in order to do so, you simply just need to analyze the level of liability that an incorrect measurement has and understand when the first try you get is the only try you get to get it right. But most importantly, understand that measurement is an abstract concept, not the automatic given you may have thought it was. Opening yourself up to this way of thinking allows you to be flexible to the inevitability of change, whether that be transitioning from a cubit to an inch or to maybe a meter, or just learning something new about the world and the people in it. See, there are extreme consequences in assuming that societal concepts are a given when oftentimes they're just a concept. You may end up on the wrong continent. You may sink a warship. Or more likely, you might delay your deck project by a few hours. But almost certainly, you'll find out that an inch is not what you thought it was.